So good evening folks, um, as you'll probably have noticed, I am not Ben of the Unlucky Frog, my name is Ian McAllister, I'm from the Giant Brain website and Brainwaves podcast, I'll be your compare uh, for the evening. Uh, with me is Ralph Horsley, Andy Hepworth and John Hodgson and I'll just get them to introduce themselves and what they've done in the world of tabletop art, starting with Ralph. Hi, I'm Ralph Horsley, I've worked as a freelance illustrator for best part of 30 years. I've worked on Dungeons & Dragons, Magic the Gathering, Pathfinder. I've worked with Games Workshop. I've worked with all the major publishers really over the course of my career. Right. Uh, I'm Andy Hepworth and I guess I started about 20 years ago uh, doing a little bit of uh, work for Games Workshop and uh, Chivalry and Sorcery and more recently a lot of work for White Wolf and I've been art directing for Calliope Games for uh, almost four years now. So, uh, I'm John Hodgson, um, About been working about the same length of time as Andy, actually about 20 years. Um, I worked on Warhammer Historical for a very long time. Uh, I was creative director at Cubicle 7 for a long time. I worked on games like The One Ring, uh, what else were people known for? Dragon Warriors, I did the covers for that. And lo loads of loads of different things. Yeah, Dungeons and Dragons I've worked on. Pathfinder, similarly. So yeah, that's me. Great, so we've got some questions that were submitted by folk over the last sort of couple of months. So we're going to go for those first. Uh, then we'll open up the floor to some questions. And if no one has any, I've got a few of my own that we can ask. And I believe the guests have brought along some questions for each other as well. So, uh, gents, just whoever wants to go first. Uh, do you think that sort of everyone is capable of producing the kind of artwork that you see in sort of board games and role-playing games? Is it, is, it, is it something anyone can do or does it need a sort of particular style? I don't know whether you necessarily need a particular style, but like anything, there is a craft, there's a skill set there. So uh, to say that anyone can do it, I think is probably a bit misleading in that, you know, my son who's only 12 certainly couldn't do the same sort of work that I'm producing. Um, but to say that there's there's opportunities out there for a whole range of abilities and a whole range of people, I, I think is true. And that's one thing that I do like about the games industry. It is in some ways a hobby industry and it's, there's also a spectrum from people self-publishing or semi-professional publishing. Sure. There's a whole range of, of um, business type models out there and publishing type models. And within that, there's obviously scope for different types of artwork and people with different experience levels. I mean, when I started out, I'd do practically anything for practically any amount of money, <laughs> you know, just to get the experience. <coughs> and, and part of that was just being asked to, rather than just sitting and drawing what I wanted to do at home, was someone saying, you need to draw a guy fighting a monster for this cover or for this particular product. And just having that discipline of having to fit a format and f fit a deadline and do these other things, that, that's, how you, that's how you grow as, a, as an artist. So in that sense, it's open to everyone. But mm -hmm. yes, you need to work and develop the skill set. John or Andy, any, anything to add? Uh, yeah, just that, um, you know, obviously there is, uh, as Ralph said, a, a huge spectrum, but um, I think you could work almost any style into, uh, into a product as long as your sort of vision is, is clear from the outset. Uh, um, I, as an individual illustrator, you know, you, you, you level up and you work very very hard on your craft but um you're from the sort of side of the table the opposite side of the table when you're art directing sort of um the the look that you're going can often be a very specific off the wall thing which isn't necessarily a um high craft illustration that's the wrong way to to <laughs> word that but um uh Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I was going to come at this from sort of two, uh, the top end and the bottom end, if you like. That So right now, you know, we're publishing, my company Handiwork Games is publishing a series of games illustrated by my two sons who are young. You know, they keep changing their age. I wish I would keep it still. <laughs> um, Rory, Rory was nine when he illustrated 
the Forest Dragon by Roy H. Nine and his, his brother was seven. So that, but it's a very specific thing that, that is aiming to be the thing it is. Yeah. So, you know, I think certainly there is, as board games get bigger and bigger and bigger, it can bear a broader range of styles, you know, which is great, good. So it should. Um, I think at the, at the other extreme, and this is a little bit maybe technical and in industry, there are a lot of people trying to be, say, board game illustrators who have uh, a style or a portfolio that isn't suited to illustration, is perhaps more suited to something like concept art um, and, and speed painting and so on, who maybe mistake, uh, certainly role-playing games illustration is perhaps easy and easy money and, and don't do as well in the long run because it's not easy and it's not something you can just toss off in between other jobs if you're going to do well at it you can certainly do there's a lot of that about um but i think there are within professional illustrators there are some people that are bet better suited to certain types of games illustration than others yeah i mean do you, and that leads quite nicely on to our, the next question i submit which is do you, do you think that there are certain styles that just like point blank are not suitable for like well most of your sort of rpg illustrators so particular styles that aren't suitable for RPG illustration in particular? I think uh, it's a bit, again, a bit of a depends answer. Yeah. I think you could make a very good fist of almost any style as long as it was consistent and intentional and properly art directed. Um, and, and a lot of that will come down to the art director, actually. Because I was you know, I'm trying to think of something ridiculous. We go, of course, potato prints would be wrong. No, they wouldn't. <laughs> you know, not if it was a game that was, you know, suited that style. If it was a game about, um, yeah, I've just been, we were just talking before that we started recording. I spent some time in Finland recently and the, the Finnish LARP scene covers incredibly diverse topics. It's absolutely inspirational stuff. And I could see, you know, literature for, say, a Finnish LARP about, I don't know, a play group or something would not be an unusual topic yeah. for, for that to cover. So therefore, you know, potato printing would be better than getting Jeff Easley to do it. You know, that would, <laughs> see, would look a bit out of place. Um, I suppose that's a bit of a cute answer. I'm trying to think, I did have a thought about something that wouldn't be appropriate, uh, but it's gone now. So you guys take over quick <laughs> while I try and recover it. Well, I think the point you're making though, isn't it? It depends on the product. And, and that's the nice thing, certainly here, looking around all the board games and um, I'm a board game player myself and certainly looking around the stands, a lot i suppose the key thing is really is that the the artwork has got a function it's not just there to be decorative although that might be part of the function it's there to to, to add something to that product or to sell that product or to tell you something about the game world or whatever else so it's about matching those two things together so as john says if it if it's about a playgroup and it's potato prints that matches if it's a if, uh, i don't know i saw a board game I was looking at earlier, which was about making patchwork quilts. Well, obviously, that's going to require a different art style to if you're doing uh, some samurai battle game or something. So that is really what's important here is not that one art style trumps another. It's that that art style works with that product in some way to enhance that product because ultimately being an illustrator isn't just about making a nice picture. It's about making a nice picture that works to sell that product, sell it both in terms of it being commercially viable, but also sell the idea of what that thing is. So for me, I'm, a lot of the work I've done has been role-playing game book covers, and you're selling what's happening within that supplement. So if you, if you buy this supplement, it's going to be about going into a city and exploring a city and all the weird things that might happen there, or it might be about going into the, the forest and fighting owlbears or whatever it is, you know, and that tells you something about what the characters are in the game that you might play, what the setting is, what the world looks like. And those things are all part of the function of, of art within, within that context. So that's really how, from my mind, mm. these things have to work. Uh, the only thing I think I'd, I'd add to that is, you know, there's a, a core group and, and broad style similarity to, you know, the mainstay of, of fantasy game art or game art, I should say. And if you're making the potato print game, it's it's hard to find the best potato print artist <laughs> out there. Um, and if you're that artist, finding your, you know, the market for your art is not always uh, as easy. But then again, you know, if you're part of the, the 70%, you're competing with the rest of the 70%. So. I was going to add as well, I think you're absolutely right, Andy. Um, I think there's an element as well that you, we often don't hear a lot about that's the influence of, say, distribution on, on a game, and that kind of feeds into 
I like we're using the potato print game. If you make <laughs> the potato print I think I was going to hold you for some time. You yeah. need to make it now, yeah. John. <laughs> um, you, you, are, you will pay a cost. I mean, I suppose I'm talking more from the position of publisher. You will pay a cost for making the potato print game if you, say, want it to go into Target in America. They, they will have, and the distributors that, that serve them will have certain criteria that they would prefer to see and you may not do well with a potato print game i reckon you could if you did it right i don't think it's <laughs> but but it would be a harder sell than something a little bit more mainstream and then you're just deciding what you your return will be depending on the style you go for and and whether you can live with that and that's what you want to do you know i suppose as well looking at it from an, an, an artist viewpoint mm -hmm. if you choose say because a lot of people especially when you start out they can be very hung on what their style is or what their style is going to be like and that, that's something that naturally evolves but of course you've got to be mindful of the companies you want to work for and i've seen that even within my own career i've worked for magic the gathering over the course of god how long now must be well, nearly two decades or something I've worked for, for Magic the Gathering. And even during the course of my career with them, I have seen that my employability within that company, within that brand, rise and fall depending mm -hmm. on what they do. Certain, uh, when they do certain sets and they want a more graphical style that lends itself to the work I do, then I get more work. When they've moved towards a more cinematic or concept art style, my work tends to drop off because I, I'm more in that first bracket. So if you choose, as an artist, if you choose an art style that is a potato print, then you're saying, I'm excluding myself from a lot of uh, potential work out there. If you choose, as Andy said, a more mainstream style or, you, or you're more flexible within that style, then you're giving yourself more job opportunities. And <coughs> part of going out there and getting work is saying, is telling an art director that you can provide what they want for that product. And, and you're, you're selling yourself and saying, look, you've got to, you're taking a chance on me. You could go to an artist you're already employing and, and you know what they're going to give you. But if you want to hire a new artist, I've got to somehow in my portfolio suggest to you that I can deliver the same or actually ideally better than that you're already getting from them. And, and it's how you go about doing that is the challenge maybe. And part of that clearly is adopting a style that it isn't copying someone else necessarily, but is certainly within the same broad remit as that. Mm -hmm. Do you know, I, f I feel very defensive about the potato print game now. <laughs> 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 like, weirdly, I feel like, I, you know, in my heart. Well, um, you, you, yeah. can come, you can come back to Tabletop Scotland next year, a 20, 2020 <laughs> release from there, Handiwork Games. Um, uh, it's something I was going to say, because this is, like, uber-specific, but when I think back to, say, you know, Ralph, you were talking about magic and stuff, and I was thinking back to when Dungeons & Dragons 3rd edition was, was kind of the thing, and I can remember very clearly... We, we, I've known Ralph for years and years. Just, uh, this is not going to be like super intimate story. Um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I've already oversold it. Well, I just <laughs> spit it out, John, for crying out loud. Um, so uh, I remember the, the sort of style they were looking for was very well defined, and I think your work fits it really well, Ralph. And you also, I remember we were all trying to get there almost, and I think you did really well at it. And conversely, I came to learn it wasn't what I could do well. And I'm very cautious when I say it wasn't what I wanted to do because that sounds like you're going, oh, I didn't want to do it anyway. I bloomin' did. Uh, I really, <laughs> really wanted. And I did a bunch of gigs on D&D on &D 3rd edition. Um, but ultimately, I found I was incredibly self-conscious when I was making the work. It wasn't my best work by a long way because I just it just didn't suit me. It was really high action, a lot of sort of um, American comic book influence in there somewhere that I just can't do all that. And I started to realize what, what I wanted to do was something very different and the people I was looking to in terms of art were, were not doing that. And actually that was the making of me when I gave up trying to be something that I wasn't any good at and relaxed a little bit into and tried out doing stuff. That probably led me much more in the direction of getting the work on the One Ring and that took me a very long way, you know, by stopping trying to do the high action stuff and looking back at people whose work I really admired, like, you know, John Howe, Alan Lee, that stuff. I didn't see them doing loads of action scenes, people leaping around and that kind of stuff that 3E wanted. And I think there's two ways you can go. You can flex your style to match and do really, really well or plow your own furrow and, and do well at that. However, often we make, we know plenty of people who make the wrong choice and, and maybe a bit too easily give up being flexible and try and, 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 reject what they're asked to do which i think can be a big mistake it's a really it's a really tricky one that about when you should bend without breaking break without bending that sort of stuff yeah um, and yeah. everyone's got to find their own way through that um i think it's difficult but i think yeah. ultimately is, is you've got to try and do the best work you can do yeah you know on any yeah. project you do you've got to try and do the best work you can do and do the you know and do the best for yourself really mm. and hopefully that will reap its rewards because people are looking for quality 
ultimately, mm-hmm. and, you know, and, yep. and quality does shine through. Yeah, it's quite difficult to find your voice sometimes, and you know, not um, you're not usually conscious of it. I don't think. You know, I think your your style and your voice, for want of a better word, just largely develops over time. You uh, either choose jobs which send you down a certain certain road, or um, match your style to the the jobs which you you are getting um but yeah it's difficult mm. on that it's, it's hard it's an evolution. i can't, I can't I mean, uh, sort of yeah, track yeah. when when i started doing work like x you know i'm sure there's you know a, a a grade into um a grade into doing that and then a grade out the other end as i get interested in something else and and yeah and i think that's that. healthy as well isn't mm. it i think you've got to be evolving i think that the I'm sure we've all, certainly for myself, I, I've, although I can sort of objectively sit back and think I'm better than I was 10 years ago, it doesn't actually feel like that when you're doing it. Because you, the more you know, the more you don't know. It's, it's, it's a weird thing. I know that if I, when I think, because I'm self-taught and I did a degree in English l- and literature and librarianship of all things. And during the course of that, I decided I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be an artist. And I had a couple of, I was quite active in doing fanzines. I was, has some stuff published in a role-playing magazine and thought, great, I could do this, I could be an artist. If I actually knew how bad an artist I was at the time, <laughs> in object sense, I probably would have you know, never done that. I would be a librarian now. You know, but thankfully, that ignorance served me quite well. That <laughs> ignorance and stubbornness served me quite well, really. But, but even now, you know, I'm, I'm continu- continually critical of what I'm doing and, and, and evolving, and hopefully that I, s- my, my, and I can see my style has evolved, not just in terms of some of my anatomy my understanding of anatomy is better or my drawing is better, but also what I want, how I want to express my art and w- what I think works better for me qualitatively has changed. You know. Yeah, wow, that, that's really interesting. It keys into something that me and Andy were talking about in the week. Um, there's a, there are many people on the internet who will take their children's drawings and they're a professional illustrator and they turn it into like a, a real monster from, it looks like it's from D&D or a comic. And now I, like, I got confessed, I really hate that. <laughs> because <laughs> I, the kids' drawings are always better by millions of multipliers than the 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 sort of commercial pap that the 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 well-meaning you know real illustrator does just ruins these kids' drawings that are by far you know, so much better. Um, and I was saying to Andy, I said like either. I've reached a new understanding of what I like in artwork, or I've just like, my brain's just crashed into a ditch. It really has, you know, and I don't know. I, it, will, it remains to be seen. I mean, for me, it was discovering Core Block, who illustrated a lot of Tolkien's work, and it is nothing like, say, the movies. It is very symbolic. It's not trying to be well drawn in inverted commas. It's quite childlike, and I just love it. And it, it, I think his illustrations are fantastic. Tolkien loved them, actually. Um, he says, allying himself with Tolkien's <laughs> taste. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a call to authority. <laughs> you know, yeah. but Tolkien that, agrees with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. on, that, on that point, I mean, for certainly mm. m- for me, one of the biggest influences growing up was Dungeons and Dragons. And I know that mm. following this seminar now, there's going to be the screening of the Eye of the Beholder, the, um, the art of Dungeons and Dragons. And of course, first edition Dungeons and Dragons art, a lot of the artists there, they were just hobbyists. They, they mm. you know, if we go back to does any art fit a product? Well, a lot of them weren't very good artists. And, and you know, and I think and objectively you can sort of look at that and say, it's not great art in, in a qualitative sense, like the anatomy wasn't necessarily great, you know, the line work wasn't necessarily great. But what they were telling narratively was really strong and mm-hmm. it sold that game, you know, uh, and, and I, uh, that's what I wanted to emulate. I didn't want to go and emulate Rembrandt or something. I wanted to go and emulate this guy doing this line drawing in the monster manual of a rust monster because that was what was exciting <laughs> to me or the gelatinous cube or whatever it was. That yeah, was that that's the exciting stuff. It's got that sort of mad energy, hasn't it, yeah. that I respond to really strongly, that stuff, even though you, you might not know that from if anyone even knew what, knows what my work looks like. You might not know, but just the... Again, it's something to come back to a lot. It's the sort of love that's in it is just beams out of it, and the enthusiasm I think is really important. And it's really I've seen uh, it, you know the tides turn all the time, but for a while I think in our field there was an enormous push back to almost like classicism and very academic drawings, and people in the states were setting up ateliers to do to draw plaster casts, and I was like, oh, I hate this stuff. 
I hate, you know, I did, you know, Ralph was in you were, uh, you know, librarianship and English literature. I did a fine art degree. You know, I'm trained as an abstract painter. I wasn't trained as a, you know, I went to art school, but I didn't do sort of life studies and all that kind of thing. I, you know, very much more um, contemporary art stuff. Um, and I find much more excitement in a lot of what you're talking about than maybe that real push to, to be good art in the, with a big capital A that doesn't necessarily, I mean, it's great, you know, well, well done, those people that can do that stuff. Um, that sounded really patronizing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I also meant to say, and of course, you know, the Eye of the Beholder movie that, that's showing later, which Ralph is in, which you won't mention, is, you know. Yeah, that'll be, that's uh, half eight, uh, half eight, is it? Yep. Yeah, so about half hour really after, good. after we finish up here. Really, really good. It's well worth watching. I was mm -hmm. saw it in the week and was really inspired by it, actually. It really reminded me of a lot of stuff, you know, that's yeah. really exciting mm. and cool. And Christopher Burdett is in it, a friend, is, a mutual is, friend of ours, and he's really, I love, cr again, just crazy energy and enthusiasm. And, well, everyone in it is very good, but. But yeah. maybe that is key. Maybe that's one thing that is great about this industry work. It is that people have, are enthusiastic and passionate about it. And, you know, and, and like you were saying, people that maybe artists that are just sort of thinking, oh, I'm just going to do it on the side, but really I want to be a concept artist for movies or something like that. You know, for me, I, I, I'm actually very happy to be in the place I'm in where I'm producing artwork for role playing games and board mm -hmm. games and card games. I don't want to go off and do movie concept work. Well, that might be cool in its own way, but to be honest, I actually really like the space I'm in. Mean, I like this industry. I like this environment. I like the work I get given to do. I get to do really fun, interesting things, you know, mm. that you wouldn't do if you're doing. I mean, like, there was certainly for a while, I mean, I think it's moved on from this, but there's certainly a while, like, any fantasy book cover seemed to me involve someone cropped off from the waist upwards. It looked like it's photo reference to hell and there was with a castle in the background. Mm. And it's like, I don't want to do that. I want to do someone leaping around fighting an owl yeah. bear. You know, that's that is that's <laughs> more exciting to me. That's yeah. where that's where my passion was as a teenager or whatever. That's why I got into doing what I'm doing now. I don't want to get a couple of models in and put a cloak on them and a, some, you know, some costume I've got and take a nice photo and then replicate that photo on the book cover and put a cast in the background. That's not where my art's at. Much as that could be amazing and look great when it's done well. And that's quite the, the nice thing about working in, in board games and RPGs. To a large extent, most of us are hobbyists ourselves you know and we we love the medium and we love games and we presumably play games mm -hmm. and this segues quite nicely into the question which i had prepared <laughs> earlier oh, well, I, well, I, well I've, I've got another one from submitted but go ahead no, please uh, i i oh, wondered no. uh, what the games were which sort of either kept you in the hobby or inspired you to kind of pursue game art as a as a career great question mm -hmm. well for me it's easy it was Dungeons and dragons uh -huh. straight off you know my my there's two two i uh, quote two major influences really on on my art development um because i'd always drawn and whatever as a kid i drew whatever probably knights and military stuff i was quite interested in that sort of military history type background and things but there's two key elements one was uh, it, last year at primary school, I had a teacher who was very good at reading the story at the end of the day. And one of the last stories he read to us was The Hobbit. And he did it brilliantly. And he did a wonderful golem. And he had this huge Adam's apple, which <laughs> even now I can picture Bobby from the <laughs> It did like golem. And he did this amazing sort of, you know. And, that, and I was part of a precocious reader, which is probably why I did English literature and librarianship. And I read The Lord of the Rings. I must admit, I struggled with the last book, but it, it brought me Every into that world. Right. And then a couple of years later, my best friend got basic Dungeons and Dragons for a birthday present. And then that was it, you could play in that world. Mm. And seeing those, as I say, seeing those illustrations and later getting Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, the first edition, and seeing the artwork in that and playing in that game world, my drawings were just of my role playing characters and the things we'd done on a weekly basis. So it was my character, you know, whatever, the barbarian fighting the goblins or, you know, there were these narrative stories. So I just do page after page. It was almost like comic book sort of narrative stuff. and that. And then it's and playing Dungeons and Dragons fed in. And to me, it was a career high when I ended up working on Dungeons and Dragons and then for, for fourth edition, doing work on the Player's Handbook and the Dungeon Master's Guide, the Monster Manual, looking back and thinking, God, this 12, 13-year-old kid living in Kendall in the Lake District in the middle <laughs> of nowhere, you know, to suddenly be working on this, this thing. It was, it was, you know, it was quite a step. And I still get a kick mm -hmm. out of thinking that that happened and I'm in this position now. For yourself, John? Um, definitely similar story, but Dragon Warriors, which is the sort of UK yeah. classic dungeon bashing game. Um, 
really, really loved it. Got it at a school book club. Loved the artwork, an enormous amount. Leo Hartus in particular, his work. Never mind the covers so much, um, but, but what was inside the pages was just brilliant. Real typical British fantasy storybook fairy tale stuff. I just thought it was really amazing. Um, and yeah, and just sort of ditto's Ralph's story because I ended up working on the second edition via James Wallace and Magnum Open Pr Opus Press. And that was that was absolute joy to get to do it. And again, you're like, what? You know, actual Dragon Warriors. Yeah, it's great really, cover really art. Cool. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's good. It was really, really nice to get to do it. Um, I'm trying to think of stuff that's maybe still keeps going. I mean, we, we still play D&D &D now, which is cool. Um, our own sort of weird version of it that I have to be very careful because we yeah we're working on some D and D projects now and I'm like wait is this like the way we play it or actual D and D um, <laughs> <laughs> and it's never actual D and D um, I don't think of anything else really good I mean bo board games have been a really interesting the rise of sort of Euro board games I won't go on about it too much because it's a real um, sort of cliched story but just those kind of experiences and the sort of diversity of experience that you can get from board games has been really important. Um, and being able to play with my kids and stuff has been really, really cool. So, yeah. What about you, Andy, since you asked the question? I was going to say, yeah, yeah. now I've got an essay prepared. For yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't know it's hard to answer essay. your own questions. Yeah. I haven't, I'm not ready for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Specifically asking. No, D&D uh, &D was, was the one which kind of hooked me into the, uh, um, into the hobby originally. But I think it was Vampire, The Masquerade, which mm -hmm. kind of showed that a game could be something something else and something different and the art uh, just as i was finishing high school like tim bradstreet's art really uh -huh. kind of struck struck a chord uh with me at the time and uh um you know like you guys as well you know getting to work on vampire changeling werewolf exalted all you, you know all the the white wolf games and now the onyx path games um was just you know it's all downhill from there <laughs> <laughs> well i'll come back to the submitted questions for a moment then we'll come back to ralph and john with the questions they prepared uh the last one here i've got is how we've sort of touched on it a little bit with like sort of different art styles and that kind of thing but how, how do you ensure that the art or graphic design you're working on is, is sort of sympathetic to a game's sort of mechanics as well as sort of its setting? Is that something that's ever in your briefs as artists? Um, no, not, well, I, th I think it certainly helped, say, working on Dragons, knowing, having played the game, mm. I think it helped inform my art, it, not necessarily in terms of the mechanics, in terms of what you need to roll to hit something on the D20 or whatever, but in terms of, Okay, well, if you're an adventurer, you're going to have your your rope and your ten foot pole and your you know s scroll cases and all that. So it's going to inform it in that sense of like, sure. and that's something I always I've always enjoyed with the Dungeon Dragons uh, work. And I think 3.5, especially, well, you know, the, the later editions really I think played on that a lot more, where the characters really looked like they had all the kit that you would have <laughs> on your your character sheet. So you would have multiple pouches and you'd have your potions because that's that's what the you know the players would have, and I think the art reflects that. So in that sense, uh, that's true. Something like, um, well, a lot of the time, of course, you don't know what the mechanic is. Mm. Uh, I mean, I've done a lot of work on on Magic: The Gathering, and there, you, you they specifically won't tell you the the mechanic because they're they're really strict on on how that information gets out, and the end they're probably sure. the strictest non disclosure agreements I've worked with is Magic: The Gathering, and they're very close on what, what information they give you but you can sometimes maybe work out what the mechanic might be if it's a blue spell and it's it's about time or something like that you can maybe think it, you know what what it might be or it's a black black spell it's something to do with undead or graveyards or something like that you can you could think what the mechanic might be but really to me it's more about giving a narrative or giving a feel of what that setting is and what the game is so it's it, as i say it's not so important about you need a 16 to hit no. someone on a d20 it's it's more like <coughs> what's what's the character going to look like what's the feel of that type of character uh, you know what's the feel of a blue spell or whatever within within magic that's that's more for me of what it's about less about these specific mechanics for yourselves andy and john anything to add I'm trying to think if I've ever had a brief which has explained, you know, the dice mechanics <laughs> of what uh, what I'm supposed to be illustrating. Um, you, you very often have to um, 
illustrate the specific effect of a spell rather than you know the the mechanics of sure. it um uh i don't really think it's no. often been an issue Ex or maybe once in exalted you can you can combo all of your spells or crafts whatever you want to call them in a row so they wanted um somebody attacking and parrying at the same time which you know which is not an easy thing to do i probably yeah. failed hideously <laughs> to do it but the the brief was probably a movie scene of you know somebody uh rolling along the ship deck killing two people and then parrying the third or something like that <laughs> one of those easy briefs that we all yeah. like yeah <laughs> i suppose i could i'd sort of cheat a little bit in the because I've done a lot of <coughs> art direction, I think that more comes under art direction than than what illustrators are supplied with, and the art director is kind of intermediary to to, to translate what's going on in the rules um, or at least in the text to then supply that to the artist, so the artists don't need to know almost, and they can concentrate on just the content of an illustration. Um, you don't often get a lot of freedom to do that interpretation as the illustrator, but you certainly it certainly is your job as the art director. And I've done a lot of work where I was art director, artist, or lead artist is a more common term for that. Certainly on uh, Tolkien stuff I've worked on, it was really important to dig down with stuff that was not literally in the text. Funnily enough, I've had to, you can t it's handy that I talk a lot to people because. Um, there was a conversation, another conversation this week uh, about sort of melancholy in Tolkien. Someone said some very kind things about my work I'd done on the first edition of the One Ring and, and melancholy and that kind of stuff that was never specifically in the text of the game, but it is absolutely a big theme of Tolkien and small characters in big landscapes is something that I'm kind of known for doing. And I think being able to feel your way through that is really important. Um, there's a couple of paintings that I personally really like that I made for the One Ring that I won't really be able to do radio ventriloquism and describe but because they'll just sound rubbish in words because that's <laughs> I think that's when work is good because you can't you know sum it up in a few words but there's one I did of a sort of it's like golden hour there's there's some rather melancholy looking characters setting up a, a campsite and a, a, it's a golden hour sort of time you know very golden light um, and they're all a bit wistful and it's all about passing time and stuff and I think that stuff is where you that's what you're sort of aiming for if you can um, in a way, it's easier with Tolkien if you can operate on that level because his themes are quite easy to grasp. I don't know what those themes are in D and D. I don't know if D and D has those fighting and shit. <laughs> excuse my French, it's probably. But you know, um, it's great to work on something where you get those kind of themes to more, more. I suppose more literary themes to key into is is very helpful. And I certainly tried very hard to do that. Um, sure, I think that's maybe the point, isn't it? It is more about themes and moods yeah. and things like that. Yeah. So if you're working on Warhammer, you know, I've done quite a lot of stuff from Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay over the p past years and, and the latest edition, and, and the mood there is about it being grim and dark and everything's a bit doomed anyway and everyone's a bit messed up and everyone's a bit ugly and, you know, a bit dirty. And that's what you're trying to convey, that sort of feel. I suppose it goes back to what I was saying earlier about the art matching the product and you're trying to give a narrative and tell people about the world. It's less about this is a percentage-based game or this is a D20-based game or what, of D6 or whatever. It, that's, that's, in a sense, a less interesting function of the art. Uh, you're telling people about the, s the feel or the style of the game. Um, that's, what, that's what I think, anyway. There's a funny mentioning Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, the, the latest edition. In the, the core book, I didn't touch your covers particularly, Ralph, other than pre-press work, but there isn't a single illustration in fourth edition core book that, that didn't cross my desk, and I added, like, splatters onto <laughs> of just dirt on everything, <laughs> absolutely everything. I worked on every single illustration to add more dirt and, like, texture to it. Uh, every single piece was, was passed through <laughs> across my desk to have yeah. more splatters. I've got about six different splatter brushes that <laughs> provide dirt <laughs> on everything. Particularly, yeah, I hope you don't mind me saying it, particularly Andy, because Andy Go does some it. beautiful yeah. sort of yeah. clean work. I'm like, oh, this needs Never more. working for him again. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of, yeah, just a lot of dirt yeah. was added, and I suppose that's in line with that, you know, that, that kind of stuff. But there isn't a mechanic for dirt in the game, is there? No, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> there should be, maybe. I don't know. Sort, of, sort of baked in. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so Andy's had his question to the other. So John, what's your? Oh, that's well, I actually, I was going to. Oh. Can I can I put yeah, my question? Okay. Oh, okay. Fol sure. It follows on a little well, so bit. Sure. You can go yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it might be the same question. <laughs> it might be the same question. Well, I think it will be anyway. 
So the, the, the both of you have already touched upon this, that you yourselves, of course, both came from sort of freelance or whatever backgrounds, but you now, uh, in different ways, have, have functioned as art directors or have worked as art or are working as an art director. And I suppose the question I wanted to ask was, how do you see that's impacted on your work? Uh, has it changed your attitude to the, the fr illustration work you, you, you produce yourself? Um, I'm just curious to see you know, what influence that's had, because clearly there's one thing for me, I've never worked as an art director, so I'm always used to receiving an art brief or whatever and, and, and having that interaction. I've learned how to manage that in my own way or, or my understanding of what the expectations the art director has, but you've been on both sides. So you've had to write that art brief and you've had to manage artists and assess their work in terms of, well, I suppose in terms of a number of criteria. And has that then impacted back on how you've looked at your own work and how you've changed your approach? Go on, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> He's thinking. Oh, it's too, 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 much, to think too, many, too many caveats in there, wasn't there? <laughs> I, I don't think it's, it's affected the, uh, the way I would approach you know, painting or, or drawing an image. I think it might have affected um, the way I react to criticism. And you learn, learn quite quickly that, um, you know, th there's a bit of give and take um, once you've delivered uh, an illustration, sometimes, you know, they want more black in it or, you know, something changed very uh, uh, slightly. Uh, sometimes they want big changes, but um, it's made me, oh, oh I shouldn't. I shouldn't say this. It's made me more willing to just go with all the oh. the changes. You know, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think yeah. that's a positive thing. I think yeah. that's something that I've certainly felt that. Uh, well, anyway, I mean, I'm yeah. not, you know, I'm not going to answer the yeah. question for you, but I certainly feel that's a that's, uh -huh. that's a more professional attitude, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you, you you've got to got to be uh, ready to to make some changes, but you know, the 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 art director is middle management. He's getting it from the guy above him, and you know it all flows downhill <laughs> yeah. in a way. You know, so he's got to coach the the verbals he's getting from the top to, you know, the the guy um, that he's hired and he's he's dealing with, and and try and make that as palatable as possible to to the artist and the guys who just say and girls, sorry, uh, yeah, I'll I'll do it are. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I suppose there's a few, it's quite a complicated question. Um, I definitely was really shocked how little contact time when I became an art director I had with artists. As an artist, I foolishly thought most of the job was talking to artists. And sometimes I had frustrations that art directors didn't spend more time communicating to artists. Why don't they just spend more time explaining things? You just don't have it. It's like 10% of your time is, is, is co in contact with the artists and the rest is, it is a middle management position. It's, it's quite tough because you are, yeah, spinning a lot of plates and trying to please everybody. Um, I think I got a rude awakening to how I was very strong on kind of supporting the artist, communi the artist community, which hopefully I still am, but like artist rights in the workplace and so on. I tempered that a great deal when I discovered how, f just how flaky an enormous proportion of freelance artists are. <laughs> and I was shocked and really saddened by it actually and could no longer engage in quite the same fierce way I had before fighting for people when I discovered how flaky people could be. And you know, well, you don't, y you're not keeping up your end of the bargain to demand <laughs> greater, uh, greater things. And I, I, that was a big disappointment to me actually. But it also, I had some questions about how I had got as far as I had got with my own understanding my quality that is not as high as that. Like either of you two, right, are both better draftsmen than I am, absolutely. Um, but because I just turned up and did the work, you know, that was which is, that's the skill, you know, I never, I never understood that. Yeah, turning it in, being polite, replying to things, meeting deadlines, I never questioned it, really. I just did it because I thought I was, t I heard it was really important to do it, so I did it. Um, but that is not very, co well, it's not uncommon. And I mean, certainly, I don't want anyone who works for me to think I'm talking about them because I don't work with people that don't meet their deadlines or that I'm not happy 
with, you know, Pat, if you're listening, it's okay that you're like two <laughs> weeks late. Um, but there's certain artists that I will brief knowing they're going to be two weeks late, but they're worth the wait for because the work will be worth it. And I know they're two weeks late, so I don't give them the real... D I mean, I always give them the very important <laughs> real deadline. <laughs> <laughs> we we, we can edit that later. <laughs> it was interesting you say that, John, because I, I remember several years back having a conversation with an art director at Wizards of the Coast. And, I, and I, like you, I always thought that there were certain things you were meant to do as a, as a professional artist. You were meant to do things on time and you know do what the job asks of you uh, and she said to me she said i look for for the three things i look for from an artist and as long as they can meet two of them i'm going to keep hiring them and so the three things i look for is they can meet deadlines they are they can produce good quality work not just they do what's sufficient but they can raise the bar basically they can do good quality work and third that they're easy to work with mm. and at the time i thought well okay i meet deadlines and i think i'm easy to work with <laughs> hopefully, I, hopefully I can get the other one and she kept hiring me so you know yeah. but I was shocked that she didn't expect all, you know that that was enough for her really mm -hmm. that you were easy enough to work with and you met deadlines and you could produce obviously you couldn't be rubbish but you, you know you just had to meet this minimum bar of, of quality yeah. Meeting yep. deadlines is yeah. so valuable yeah. as yeah. an art director. Um, it, it makes a lot of work for you, doesn't it, when you have to reschedule everything or you miss a print slot or what have you. I mean, that's kind of on the art director if you miss a print slot. Maybe that's a bad, bad... And, and also, like you're saying, something I think I've come to appreciate throughout my career is that, that you know, when you first maybe someone says, OK, we, we don't want that goblin to look like that. Can you give it bigger ears or a longer nose or whatever the criticism is? Uh, first, I think lack of experience and maybe being a bit thick, thin skin, you think, but I really like that goblin how it is. I, I drew the best goblin I could do. That nose is just perfect. Why would you want to change it? But then you realise actually, as you say, but their criteria isn't necessarily because they didn't think it was a brilliant nose and it wasn't a well-drawn goblin. It's just that, well, our goblins haven't got noses like that. Y to fit in our style guide, they need bigger ears. They need more spikes. They need more... Mm -hmm dirt on them or whatever it is <laughs> and so, you, so you realize actually you know what i'm doing it's not a criticism of my art although that may be in there but but really it's it's saying we're trying to mold it so you fit what we want for the product so again it comes back to what i'm saying the art has got to complement the product if, if my goblins don't look like dungeon dragons goblins then then it doesn't sit the fit the product they can't use them so that so it's not a criticism of you you've drawn a, you've drawn a bad goblin or something it's just like it's not a dungeon and dragons goblin and, and also, the other thing I, I suppose is important is you're realizing that that art director is actually taking a chance from hiring you. Their job is on the line. Mm -hmm. So if they hire artists and artists produce rubbish work or are late or whatever, as you say, it, there's a chain here. It impacts on them. They aren't then doing their job. So you actually, you're potentially l l getting them to lose their job. You know, so there is a knock-on chain effect. And that's something I think I realize in the maturity thing. It's like, well, it isn't just about me and my ego and my art or whatever, is actually, I'm now, uh, albeit as a freelancer, working with that in the company, and there's a chain effect. You know, obviously if I do a good job for this art director, they, their boss likes them, and you know, so on and so forth. And, and that first thing of trying to be hired by an art director for the first time, of course they're taking a huge chance. Why wouldn't they stick with artists? They know that they c are gonna just, okay, they might not be brilliant artists, but they're gonna keep giving them what they want. They're gonna be easy to work with, they're gonna meet the deadlines. You know, and you're saying, take a chance on me. You've never worked with me before, but I'm, I'm worth that risk. And that's a big investment for them, you know. F hope, thankfully, a lot of the products I've worked on, they demand a lot of artists. I mean, Magic the Gathering has, you know, card games, there's 100 artists, 100 plus artists working on any particular edition of that at any particular time. Dungeons and Dragons, certainly, the you know, they had, uh, when they're producing a supplement, two supplements every month or something like that. There was a huge demand for art. So there was a lot, there was a lot of scope to get your foot in the door. But it's getting your foot in the door right. in the first place yeah. and then delivering, isn't it? So I've gone a little bit off topic there. No, but I, do you know, I, I really, oh. anyone listening who wants to work a, as a fancy illustrator or, you know, a gaming illustrator, a really simple tip is name your files appropriately. <laughs> and if you are asked to do it in a certain way, just do it that way. Because I worked out once, there was one point I was working on sort of four to five books a month, each which had a minimum of 30 illustrations, more like 40 to 50 average. And if I have to spend time renaming each file, even if it only takes me 30 seconds to double check I'm renaming it correctly, across that many say four four times you know 120 pieces of artwork and i'm s it, and i'm spending 30 seconds renaming each one that's an hour a month renaming files and i'm sort of not here on on this earth to rename other people's files um 
but it, that stuff really drags on you and so people that can just turn it in in the way you asked it's not a big ask so just you know that is a a really practical tip to just name your fun or at least if you can't do that name them in some sort of sensible way don't send me stuff with like final 21 you know what <laughs> I mean? like yeah thanks great i have a lot of files called that too i don't send them to anyone you <laughs> rename it yeah. so uh john let's mm. go to your question then so my and question. Uh, then we'll um we'll have a little bit of time for questions will we Five, five minutes. Oh, I'll do my, well, my question is a stupid question, so I can just, you know, I'm, I feel very ashamed that you've both thought up very sensible questions. Is it yeah, to do with potato prints again? <laughs> yeah, no, it's not. It, um, anyway. Um, so both Andy and Ralph have worked for me as, as an art director, with me as the art director. So who, and you don't have to name names, uh, who is your favorite art director you've worked for and why? <laughs> it's me, isn't it? It is you, John. Yeah, yeah it is. Well, uh, look, I mean, that's a, that's a, it is a silly question because, of course, I've got the advantage that I've known you for a long time and yeah. we knew each other when we were both freelancers and both starting out our career. And I think you've got... So we've, we've had lots of conversations over the years about working within the industry and, and what that entails. So I think when it came for me to work with you and I was, you know, appreciative that you felt my work would, would, would fit the products you, you were hiring for, it wasn't a case of you know being a friend of yours it, uh, and that's, uh, that was a, that was the i suppose there's at the core of that was respect for your professionalism that you'd only hire me if you felt i was appropriate for the yeah. product and that fed into the rest of the relationship but also uh, i uh, i suppose because you did know my work over a number of years that i felt i had a lot of freedom within that so yeah i'll give you it's, credit you're not yeah. there are other actors that have been very nice <laughs> yeah, answer, one, yeah one yeah, thing yeah, I, I was only joking about yeah, me, i know you know <laughs> <laughs> one thing I would, about one thing I would say that's interesting, especially this has been true with a number of the art directors I worked with at Hasbro, uh, Wizards of the Coast, was that forming a good relationship with an art director is key because that's, those are the people that give you work. And not every art director, so, so there might have been, I don't know, at one point say there were six or seven art directors working on Dungeons and Dragons, but maybe only three of them were hiring me. It wasn't because I wasn't appropriate for Dungeons and Dragons, but maybe some of those artists, the art directors were more, preferred my style to others. And also, some of them wanted to keep certain artists because it's like, well, I I've got Ralph Horsley working for me. I want to keep, I don't want you to have him. Mm. So you get a weird, there's a weird office politics you can get, en not engaged in ideally, but you can get involved with. And also I found that certainly there was one art director, she, she no longer works for Wizards of the Coast, she, she, but Mary Kolkowski, and she was a key art director for me. She gave me some of my first work on Forgotten Realms, and I worked with her a lot on Forgotten Realms, but then she moved. She did miniatures. She was on doing Dungeons So suddenly, I was doing miniature designs mm -hmm. for Dungeons and Dragons. She moved somewhere else. I was doing that because she kept hiring me, because she liked work, because I ticked those boxes. I was easy to work with, I met deadlines, and she felt I could do these other things. So actually, forming a good relationship with an art director is key, because you'll tend to follow art directors around. I've done the same thing. When I first started working on Magic the Gathering, Jeremy Cranford was the art director. He hired me, I worked with him. He left that company, he went to work for Upper Deck for a while. Uh, I forget, but they were doing the World of Warcraft trading card yeah, game. Yeah. I went and did World of Warcraft trading card game with Jeremy Cranford at Upper Deck. He left Upper Deck, because, yeah, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Upper Deck was interesting uh, to work with them uh, at the time. Uh, and he went and worked directly with Blizzard, who were then doing the World of Warcraft trading card game, and then latterly Hearthstone. I worked on Hearthstone because Jeremy Cranford oh. was the art director. So basically, I had a good relationship with the art director. I moved with him, and that went with those different products. Hopefully, along the way, I had I'd worked on you know Magic. He went and left Magic, but I had already got my foot in the door. So then, when Jeremy Jarvis took over as art director, I was still working on Magic, but I'd also now working on the World of Warcraft TCG. So that's a healthy working relationship for me. For yourself, Andy. Mm -hmm. um, again, I'm not. I'm not going to name names because you know oh. they're they're all good, and, <laughs> and some of them aren't. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, no, the 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 art directors who. <laughs> what, <laughs> what are you laughing <laughs> at? And, yeah. and my own ineptitude, John. Um, the art directors who trust you and who uh, hire you because they know that you can do a job and give you a brief and let you get on with that job and as an art director as well the artists who I know are going to come through for me are you know th th you know that's the other side of the coin um, sure. and uh, John was one of those art directors no, you know he knows no. why he's hired me he asks me to do a specific set of things and 
then he puts extra textures on them. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and then I repaint it. I just repaint it myself. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> and don't tell you until now. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got a few minutes left. Has anyone got any questions from the floor? If you do, please come up to the microphones at the front here and Correct. speak into that. Anyone? Everyone's shying away from it. Yeah, it's I was say, like, if, you don't, if you don't want to come up to the microphone, <laughs> you can speak from your seat and I'll oh, we've repeat got it. Good cause yeah. That's pretty harsh. I wondered if any of you have any thoughts on female representation in fantasy art? It's not very well represented on this panel, is it? Female no, representation. That is true. I was yep. quite shocked to turn up to another sausage fest of a panel, but there we go. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, I mean, we did a... Sorry, I could also answer the question. I could listen. <laughs> um, yeah, we did, I did a really enjoyable series of, of, of panels at Gen Con with uh, Nicole Lindrys of Green Ronin and Rich Thomas from Onyx Path about gender representation in fantasy art, and we did it two years running, and it was really good. And all of us on the panel, I'm not a massive, I don't know if you guys heard this talk before the, before the event, I'm, I'm not a massive fan of this, so we sit up here and you guys sit down there and you're to listen and we talk. I'm not a massive fan of that. And in these talks, we just really took opinions and, and observations from the floor and it was really great to, I learned so much from that um, which is really, really great and I mean I've always tried since hopefully if you're aware of what I do I try to include as many people as possible I came up with the catchphrase that Cubicle 7 is still using but everybody's invited to the fun which I think is very important I really want very strong reasons why people are not invited if there is you know oh no we can't have that I want to know why because it's just it's like the great strength of fantasy and, and tabletop games is that absolute nonsense. And that's what I really like about it. <laughs> so so you've got to have some very strong reasons to not, not be inclusive of what you do. You can run into problems. I mean, we, I could talk all night about some of the practical problems. There are some old men running things still who are difficult to get around. I had some problems with things I made on games I don't want to <laughs> mention the names of where the old man who has the money or is in charge of, say, a license goes, oh, why isn't she prettier? And you're like, really? Oh. Like, is that still a thing? But it is for, there are, you know, I think we live in a time where different generations are coexisting with very different ideas. Yeah. Um, so I'm getting really forthright. I'll shut up now. No, I think, it, I think it's really you know. important. I think that is yeah. something that, yeah. you know, not just women, but representation in general, because that's something yeah. you're doing, you know, as an artist. Mm -hmm. you, you, as I say, it's, again, it goes back to what you're saying about the politics. If all you're doing is putting on white European men on the front cover, you, you're basically limiting that, aren't you? And, and the trouble is, of course, that's what I am. I'm a white European man. And that you tend to, especially with artists, you tend to draw yourself or you tend to put yourself in there. And, and I am very happy to say that a number of companies, and I think Wizard of the Coast have been quite a leading company in this respect, mm -hmm. have been keen to push that yep. and have been keen to get rid of those old tropes of the chainmail bikini, which I've always hated. I think it's awful. And I think it's awful that that, that, you know, that, that is still associated with fantasy art. And, and I'm glad to say I think it is growing up, but it's still that yeah. is still there. That is still there. Yeah, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah, the representation is getting better. I, I I played a lot of um fancy flight games, car game, Netrunner, and the the art team there were really good at lots yeah. of different representation. Just inc incidental uh, incidental art. There was just the 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 parents of this child and his parent happened to be same sex, and it was just totally not mentioned. It's just there. That yeah. sort of stuff is just in the background of their art, and it was great to see uh, great to see all sorts of sort of ethnicities and. But I and sexuality is being, yeah. being just represented. I certainly good. do feel that responsibility, and I, and I do sort of tick myself off sometimes when I've done a cover or something, you realise, well, wait a minute, I haven't included people, I haven't put a woman on there or something, and yeah. it's like, okay, you know, yes, yes, I have got that awareness, but I don't always live up to my mm -hmm. expectations yeah. of myself, yeah. I suppose. Oh. When I first joined uh, Calliope Games, uh, we had uh, Cassidy Werner working for us. She's... Uh, she moved on to cheap ass games and she's moved on again and i can't remember where it where she's gone but she was really adamant that um all the guys in the team sort of broke out of their automatic reactions and, and automatic you know uh stereotypes um uh and it opened my eyes, I must say, you know. So, uh, and, and but I think the industry is much, much better now than it has been. I'm sure there's still uh, a long way for us to go. But yeah. um, I think it's mo it has moved <coughs> away from that pinnacle pass, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. Which I think was was all yeah. pretty awful. I mean, yeah. never, I mean, but I also am aware there's a lot of male artists I've spoken to them who they're out there that they 
I think I'm a bit perverse I get off on doing that art. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know. Yeah, I was always really confused by that because I found it like, it was, when it comes to like adventure games, D&D games, board games, stuff, I don't really know what that's got to do with it. That really sexualized stuff just isn't part of like, Stabbing yeah. up goblins and getting gold and stuff, and then and now it's sexy time. And you're like, <laughs> yeah. oh, I don't, I just don't. Really yeah, yeah. Well, it's a teenage fantasy, I suppose, you know. Yeah. Um, but I've forgotten what I was going to say. Um, yeah, someone else carry on. I can't remember. Uh, well, uh, we've probably got time for one more yeah. question from the floor. If there's anyone who wants to ask anything. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Coming out from behind no the pressure. box. <laughs> the sound guy asking questions. So we had a hobby craft panel this morning about painting miniatures. Is there any sort of overlap in skill between doing what you're best known for in terms of like painting conventional art or on canvases and painting miniature models? Well, I started, I mean, when I started out as well, as I said earlier, my inspiration was Dungeons and Dragons first edition and it was black and white line work and that's what I did for a long time. But at the same time, parallel to that, I was a miniature painter. And, interesting, and I got to a point in my career where color printing was coming in it was a lot, and I realized actually, to get the, where the money lay, it wasn't in interior black and white artwork, it was in colour covers. And I had to teach myself to paint, basically. But all I had done at that point was miniature painting. So I had a lot of miniature paints, and that was really where my first paint, so there is an overlap in that sense, and that my first paints were, I mean, I did most of my Dungeons and Dragons work using little miniature paints. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it's really funny wow. because I worked for Games Workshop and, and, and I got a staff discount in the local shop, so I got them at half price. <laughs> and, and, I, and I was just, that's what I used. I, you know, go and get wow. artists acrylics were more expensive and there was nothing wrong. Actually, they're really quite good miniature paints because they've got a really good level of opacity and a really good level of consistency. And I know even now Wayne Reynolds still uses them. Yeah, I was going to say, so I used so, to work in there. You know, so uh, in terms of, I suppose maybe what you're saying technically, Yes, learning to mix paint and do that su that technical side of it clearly there's an overlap. If you can mix colours, which you need to do for bl and you can do blending as you do on a miniature, then clearly that's what you're doing on a painting. You're mixing colours and you're blending colours to get. And also you're trying to create a, a, a three dimensional effect because you're having uh, lights and darks. You, you're creating form, and that's something you're doing maybe in a more stylized way with a miniature. But then you know, I think that's shown if you look at my early work then I think I was, in a sense, taking miniature painting and making it 2D. Mm. Because, you know, that was the way I did form in a way that maybe I don't so much now. I was just laughing there. Because I used to work in a comic shop where Wayne Reynolds used to buy his comics and you used to come in, Ralph, to buy your comics. Yeah, Leeds was the yeah. hub of, uh, yeah, of Leeds Dungeons was, and Dragons. I don't huh? know what was in the water in Leeds. <laughs> and I, would, yeah, I always tell the story that I always used to really timidly think up of, like, the best question I could think to ask you guys is like, what, one, because I didn't want to be that guy pestering you. But all three of, you know, Kev, Wayne, and yourself would come into our shop to buy miniatures paints for your, like, Dungeons & Dragons art. So, yeah, there is totally a, a crossover. Yeah, I started painting. The, my first sort of, yeah, use of colour and stuff was, yeah, painting miniatures, definitely. Yeah. And then, you know, then I did all this sort of proper painting stuff in inverted commas. But, yeah. Yeah, definitely crossover, and I still enjoy it. I still love painting miniatures. Yeah, I'm painting Great. them even now. I've got them on the go. Yep. Yeah, yep, definitely. Likewise, yeah. Yep. I love a miniature. Yeah. For me, it's a, you know it's something that I could do creatively. I think it's in, uh, I've realised to sort of help with prevent burnout. It's good to create do creative stuff that isn't commercial. It's not work. And part of that for me is painting miniatures and doing stuff like that because there's no there's no financial yeah. application. I can't sell. I, I mean, well, <laughs> maybe someone would buy Ralph Horsley painting miniatures, but that's not the point. They're there for my personal pleasure, and they're being creative. And I could do them in front of the TV when I'm chilling out at the end of the evening. Whilst the minute I sit down and draw, instantly I'm thinking, oh well, should I put this on Instagram? Should I put it on my web shop? Even if it's just a doodle, there's there's, there's there's that other stuff around it. For me, miniatures frees me from all that. Yeah. So it allows me to be creative in a non-work way <laughs> great well uh thanks very much ralph andy and john for spending time with us and answering our questions thank you thank you so uh this is this has been recorded all night this will be up on the unlucky frog gaming sites po uh, podcast site and it'll be up on tabletop scotland site sort of in the next couple of weeks after the call once everything's been edited together there's going to be as we mentioned earlier there's going to be eye of the beholder showing in here in about 20 minutes or so awesome. uh thanks very much for coming everyone thank you <laughs>